It's your own fault. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, I will round up people who are straggling outside and uh, John. Hey. All excited about uh, having the next presentation. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about formal consultations and biological opinions in this session. And during this session, we're going to develop an understanding of the purposes of formal consultation. What's the process of formal consultation, including timelines? So, Brent, if you've got any questions over there, you're going to definitely have some on this one. Okay, get ready, get ready. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, definitions of jeopardy and adverse modification and how the service applies those definitions. And finally, how a biological opinion is organized. Okay, so what are the purposes of formal consultation? Well, to determine whether a proposed federal action is likely to jeopardize the continued existence of a listed species or result in adverse modifications of critical habitat has been designated for a listed species. What does jeopardize the continued existence mean? Defined as to engage in, engage in an action that reasonably would be expected directly or indirectly to reduce appreciably the likelihood of both survival and recovery of the listed species in the wild by reducing the re reproduction numbers or distribution of that species. That's the definition of jeopardize. What does destruction or adverse modification mean? This means a direct or indirect alteration that appreciably diminishes the value of critical habitat for the conservation of, of the listed species. And such alterations may include, but are not limit, limited to, those that alter the physical or biological features essential to the conservation of the species or that preclude or significantly delay development of these features. What are some other purposes of formal consultation? to identify means and measures by which an action may conserve listed species or critical habitat. So it's just not the impact of the species, it's how we can conserve these species in their habitat. Identify the nature and extent of the effects of the action on listed species and their critical habitat. Um, we identify reasonable and prudent alternatives, if any, when we, the service finds that the action is likely to result in jeopardy to a listed species or adversely modify critical habitat. Um, the biological opinion or informal consultation, we provide an exemption for specific levels otherwise prohibited incidental take of listed species, and we're going to talk about incidental take in the next session. And finally, um, during formal consultation, we provide an administrative record of the effects of the species from the action to update the species environmental baseline for future formal consultations. Okay, so those, that, those were the purposes of formal consultation. Now what about the process? Well, we begin when the action agency has a project and they determine that their, their action may affect or is likely to adversely affect either a federally listed species or its designated critical habitat. And the action agency contacts the service through a letter or email requests initiation of formal consultation. Right now, the only entity that can init request initiation of formal consultation is the federal action agency. In the future, who's it going to be? DOT. Yeah. Timeline requirements. Here we go for Brian. Okay, upon receipt of request for initiation of formal consultation by the action agency, the service, we have 30 days to respond. Our response includes an acknowledgement that we received the request. Um, it identifies any missing required information needed to complete our jeopardy and adverse modification analysis, and 
if, if the initiation package is complete, remember that, we provide a schedule for concluding consultation. So within 30 days. When does, when does the initiation of formal consultation start? When does the clock start? The clock starts on the day we have all the information needed to initiate consultation. And that can be when we receive the initiation request, if the information is sufficient. If it's not, we are going to ask for more information, and once we receive the information we need to initiate, that's when the clock starts. So it could be the day we receive the request. It might be quite a bit later. And you can call and ask Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, what day is, does it start? When does this clock start? Well, what, yeah, you're saying you're, oh, go ahead. Yeah, it's, 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 we, you know, there's a lag sometimes, certainly if you use snail mail. Uh, uh, but it's you know we, we can't be reviewing it if we don't have it so and uh, and we have office procedures to like date stamp something you know received and if you've got an email it's it's dated you know when you received it uh, uh, but the, uh, the the point I wanted to make is that this this information sufficiency thing uh, it's 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 the date we received all the information that's sufficient. And and the the regs specify what that is. Uh, you know, it's it's a checklist, and it's in 404. I mean, uh, 50 CFR 402.14. It's in tab 18 of your notebook. Uh, so it's that subsection 14. It's a list. You know, it's basic. It's basic stuff. You know, describe the action. Describe its the listed species that the action may affect. Uh, describe the manner of those effects and and so on. So it's not very you know detailed, but all of it's uh, subject to that best available uh, commercial and scientific data uh, standard. So if 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 we say you you may have described the action and its effects and so on, but maybe you didn't use. <laughs> the best available data. So what we will reply in a response if we're doing our job right is like you need you didn't refer to this information that we're aware of uh, that should inform your your package, your request. Uh, or or we think we know of some others and please contact so and so. Um, but but it's that getting the meeting that, that checklist that's in the regs with best available data once we have that, that's when it's the clock starts. Okay. Additional requirements. Time requirements. The service, once the clock starts, the service then has 90 days to consult with the federal agency on the action. And this consultation includes assessing the status of the species and its critical habitat. Uh, verifying the scope of the action that the action agency proposed, pro proposes, including the area likely to be affected directly and indirectly, and as well the cumulative effect of the project. Identify adverse effects likely to result in jeopardy or adverse modification of critical habitat. Um, develop reasonable and prudent alternatives. What if the action is a jeopardy action? That can't happen. So we need reasonable and prudent alternatives to get out of that, if possible. And also identify adverse effects that are not likely to jeopardy the species, jeopardize the species, but constitute take pursuant to Section 9 of the Act. Section 9 prohibits take. Other time requirements, um, develop reasonable and prudent measures as there, oh, um, and their imp implementing terms and conditions as appropriate to minimize take and identify conservation measures as appropriate. <coughs> Formal consultation, oh, questions? No, I thought you put your hand up. Um, it looks like you did. If you're ready, you know. <laughs> no, you, I'm sure we'll have one, that's fine. <laughs> okay, so formal consultation ends 90 days, 9-0, after 
days after it's been initiated. The service has 45 more days to write the biological opinion. If we can, we'll get it done early. I try to do that. Doesn't always happen. But. Um, the action agency or the applicant can request to review a draft of the biological opinion. And 135 days following initiation of formal consultation, when the clock starts, we must provide you a copy of the signed biological opinion. Although that doesn't always happen, it should. It's supposed to happen. Extending the timeline. Go ahead. Oh. I've always thought it was weird that, you know, you get a, you, you you ask for a biological opinion and and it, the process is called formal consultation, but you don't get the opinion when formal consultation is over. That it's it ha you get it 45 days after that. Um, has anyone wondered what what's the difference? Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> uh, it's during that first 90 days that that we should interact. Uh, and find out uh, we're, like, we're, like, we're seeing some effects here that we think might be um, you know avoidable or, or, or reduced uh, and let's be clear if we understand how you're proposing the action and then um, you know we might even reach some agreements during that 90 days uh, that that augment the description of the proposed action so that our analysis is clearer or that some impacts that we recognize are, are avoided. Uh, uh, so, so it's kind of like the record is still open during that first 90 days. Uh, and when we start to write the opinion after day 90, uh, that's when our admin record for our decision on the opinion is closed. We don't we don't take new stuff. Uh, we have to have a starting point at some point at which, you know, best available information is as of today, the day we start writing that BO. Um, so that's the that's the distinction between the two periods within the 135 days. Just one quick question. Earlier we discussed that you know the initial 30 days is often included in the. It's part of the 90 days, yeah. So the slide said the service then has 90 and then comes the 40 days. Yeah, no, no, no. The 30 days okay. is part of the 90 because we're reviewing the proposal at that time. And but within 30 days, we should let you know is it is it complete or not. I, I guess the question is, it's not complete. It's, a di you know, 90 days from when it starts. So, yeah, yeah okay. No, I Question: um, In terms of schedule two for the department, sometimes we have PME and a portion of design going ahead, and we have funding constraints and schedule concerns. And if if we have money that we need to put aside for, I don't know, care care funds or a certain level of mitigation, is there some point in the process that we could get guidance from you on? What we anticipate those costs would be, or like, or those uh, amount of mitigation. Uh oh, you're talking about you know, care, care fund and that kind of stuff. Or some, yeah, even with some of the other things, like I mean, that's definitely something we can talk about. Uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes we're under uh, requirements like the fiscal year would be ending or something like that, where we're just trying to make sure that we have funds put in the right place. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Good, uh, Gwen. Yeah, so if we don't get a notice that you're extending, should we be requesting that? With a reason why you need more time? He's going to get to that. Yeah, that's coming out of the presentation. <laughs> Good question, though. <laughs> okay, extending the timeline. Okay, formal consultation concludes after 90 days unless extended. If an applicant is not involved, just between the service and the action agency, 
we can both agree to a specific extension. If an applicant is involved, it's the same thing. We can agree to a certain time extension, um, provided the service provide, gives the applicant, before the close of the 90-day co consultation period, a written statement indicating reasons why a longer period is necessary to complete it, the consultation, information that is required to complete the consultation, and an estimated date for a concluding consultation. We cannot extend for more than 60 days without the applicant's consent. Yep. What what constitutes the applicant being involved versus not being involved? Uh, well, consider when you guys right now when you when you put in for a core permit, they're the action agency. The, the Department of Transportation is the applicant for the permit to fill wetlands right. under 404. That's what I mean when I say applicant. Not all actions have applicants. Some do. Pretty much all of ours are. Okay. But that's the best example for, for your purposes. When you go get a core permit, DOT's applicant. Reviewing draft BOs, uh, a biological opinion is always due no more than 45 days after the close of formal consultation unless the action agency secures the applicant's written consent for a specific extension. The action agency may request to review a draft BO. Sometimes, you know, Brent, I think you've done that before. Um, the applicant may request the draft BO from the action agency as well. All comments on the draft BO are through the action agency, although the applicant may send comments directly to the service. The service will not issue a final biological opinion prior to its due date while the action agency still is reviewing the draft. And the action agency comments on the draft BL received 10 days or less before the final BO is, for the time the final BO is due, entitle the service to an automatic 10 day extension to complete the biological opinions. Okay, so what does a biological opinion evaluate? Evaluates the current status of the species and the critical habitat throughout its range, range-wide. The current status of the species or the critical habitat in its action area. The action area is all areas indirectly or directly affected by the action, not just the project footprint or the immediate project area. And that's what we call the environmental baseline. Um, the direct and indirect effects of the action, as we talked about before, and also interrelated and interdependent actions that affect the action, um, and the effects of other reasonably foreseeable non-federal actions, future federal actions in the area, and that's how the service defines cumulative effects. And these effects are both beneficial and adverse. Now, considering the status of the species, go ahead. Since you guys are going to be doing NEPA soon, this would be a good point to mention that cumulative effects in the Section 7 context is defined differently than cumulative effects in the NEPA context. Uh, in, in the Section 7 context, it's, not, it's, it's effects resulting from non-federal actions in the action area uh, to the listed species or the critical habitat. Uh, so, whereas in the NEPA context, its cumulative effects are uh, all reasonably foreseeable uh, actions of anybody's uh, to the resource, and it's not limited to the action area uh, of of the you know the NEPA proposed action. It's, it's resource specific. Um, so in the end, we get to a similar place uh, in a Section 7 analysis because we're looking at the status of the species, which is considering the effects on the whole resource range-wide, and action area cumulative effects. And in NEPA, you're looking at all sources of effects range-wide for a resource and plus the effects in the action area. 
so, but the label, cumulative effects, has a different meaning in Section 7 than in NEPA. Just be aware of that. It's not like you can cut and paste your NEPA cumulative effects analysis into a, a BA uh, because it's different. Are interdependent and interrelated the same between <coughs> NEPA and Section 7? That I don't have a direct answer to. Um, I haven't looked at that. Uh, but interrelated and interdependent are not cumulative effects in Section 7. They are, they are actions that would not occur but for the action under consideration. Uh, so, yeah, I can't remember how it's defined in NEPA. Uh, I have, I'll, I'll look that up. Well, well, he's got my computer. <laughs> I have it on my computer. And you, ma you mentioned that there, uh, all future federal actions are not considered cumulative effects because those actions will be consulted on in the service in the future. Right. Yeah, that was another point of how we define cumulative yeah, compared to federal. the federal. Yeah. Because we consult on federal stuff. Yeah. Okay, so considering the status of the, 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 status of the species range dot wide, the environmental baseline, and all the effects we just talked about, would the action appreciably reduce the likelihood of both the survival and recovery of a listed species in the wild by reducing the reproduction numbers for distribution of that species, or would it, the action appreciably diminish the value of critical habitat for the conservation, survival, and recovery of a listed species? Those definitions, if the answer to number one is yes, that's when the first service finds jeopardy. The action will result in jeopardy. If the answer to number two is yes, that's when we find adverse modification of critical habitat. Okay, so let's apply the uh, adverse mod de definition. Federal action is likely to destroy or reversely modify designated critical habitat if the action alters the quantity or quality of the essential physical or biological features of the designated critical habitat, or it precludes or delays the capacity of that habitat to develop those features over time, and the effect is either to appreciably diminish the value of critical habitat or the conservation of the species. Okay, so what are some examples of physical and biological features of critical habitat? Space for normal growth, normal behavior for the species. Things like food, water, air, light, minerals, nutrition, other nutritional or physiological requirements, cover or shelter for the species, sites for breeding, reproduction, rearing of offspring, germination, seed dispersal, those types of things and habitats that are protected from disturbance or could be representative of historic, geographic, and ecological distributions of the species. Is that clear? These are examples of general types of things that, that are identified in critical habitat designations, but they're very specifically identified for each thing. It's not like you have to guess what they are. They're in the critical habitat designation. These are the physical and biological features that, that the service has found is essential, and that's why we're drawing this boundary around them on this map. It's because those are the things in that boundary that we need to conserve for the species. Okay, so what happens if a biological opinion for the service concludes a jeopardy or adverse modification of critical habitat uh, occurs from an action. We must provide reasonable and prudent alternatives to that action, and those, a and those alternatives have to be consistent with the purpose of the action. You have to be able to do, do the action. They have to be consistent with the DOT's or the federal agency's legal authority and jurisdiction. Those alternatives have to be economically and technically feasible. It has to be, you have to be able to accomplish them, and they, we can't ask you to spend $600 million on a project. 
And in the service's opinion, those alternatives should, will avoid jeopardy or adverse modification. Okay, so once we're finished with our consultation on the action, we provide you the results of that consultation in our document, and we call that a biological opinion. We send a copy, a signed copy, to the action agency and a, a and a copy to the applicant. What are the contents of a biological opinion? It includes a consultation history, and this is basically just a chronology of our consultation with the action agency. It includes the date formal consultation is initiated. It includes all other important activities that take place during the consultation. For example, meetings with the action agency or the applicants. Um, we would include when we receive requests for cons concurrence for other species that we're con consulting on, and when we provided concurrence concurrences for those species. So all important events in the consultation. Uh, the biological opinion, of course, includes a description of the pro proposed action, what the action agency attend intends to do, and also the action area for that action. It includes the status of the species and the critical habitat range-wide that talks about how many animals are left of the species, where do they occur, what type of habitat they prefer, those types of things, any other um, life history information that is pertinent to, pertinent to the species and threats to the species range-wide. The next section is the environmental baseline. And that is, as I mentioned, it was the status of the species within the action area, but it also includes the or, uh, other impacts on a listed species in the action area that result from all past or present federal, state, and local or private actions and other human activities in the action area. Did I get that right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. That is the section on effects of the action. We kind of talked about this over the last few days. It includes direct, the indirect effects of the action on the species, interrelated and interdependent actions, cumulative effects, we just talked about that. And finally, it includes the conclusion of whether we think the action is going to result in jeopardy to a species or adverse modifications to the species. Next section is reasonable and prudent alternatives if the service finds jeopardy or adverse modification. And if there's no jeopardy or adverse mod, the section that follows that is an incidental take statement, and that's the next the topic of the next presentation. And we'll talk about that more in a second. And following that are conserva conservation recommendations. These are discretionary activities that the service recommends the action agency do to benefit the species. They don't have to do them, but these are just things we say, hey, 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 how about doing this for this species? How about doing that? How about helping them out? And finally, uh, the last section of the opinion is a reiteration re notice. It, it documents when reiteration of consultations is necessary. Questions? Yes, sir. The, uh, can you go back to a couple slides for the environmental baseline and just talk about that one more time? Because it seems to me that it's based, I guess, the baseline of the effects of the action below. Environmental baseline, hang on a second. No, 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 no. You mean this environmental baseline? Yeah. But the effects, the effects of the, it's the status of the species in the action area, but it includes a review of all current and past effects from federal actions, state actions, local actions, private actions, and any other um, 
human activities that are affecting the species. Let's say something like agricultural practice, farming, that's taking habitat out, those types of things. And it's in the action area. It's in the action area, right. It's not range wide, that's the first first section. <coughs> yes. Oh, I'm sorry, he had a question. I was wondering the uh, I'd imagine that there are sometimes uh, when when it's, when you get a Jeopardy opinion or adverse modification of I'm sure lots of questions arise, but one of them is how does how does the service determine whether an alternative is economically and technically feasible? It seems like a very difficult thing for if, if you're getting a Jeopardy VO, we'll be talking. <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk with the action agency and, well, you know, what can you do, what does it cost, yeah. that kind of thing. I thought it was very interesting that the service puts that on themselves and says, don't that didn't work right <laughs> No, no, no. No, it's, it's very much uh, a dialogue uh, because it's, we're, we're in this together. You need to comply with 7A2. Uh, we're your advisors in that, so we're going to be coming to you to help us define something that's economically and technologically feasible that will avoid uh, jeopardy or adverse mod. We will we will not do that in a vacuum. And might that be a reason to ask for an extension in the? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, Talk to us about our project. Yeah, hopefully we'll we'll we have a good enough dialogue that we don't get to that point, uh, and and we don't you, you don't you never get one. Does anyone want to know what an appreciable reduction is? Yes, I got an idea. <laughs> you know <it> <laughs> All I know is. But I looked up the definition of appreciable, and it means measurable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> appreciable is not a defined term in the act or the reg, um, but it's used in several circumstances. <laughs> um, and you kind of have to um, uh, uh, look at the dictionary definition, which is measurable, detectable. Um, you know, endangered species are already likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future. Uh, that's that's likely to become extinct in the foreseeable future. So they're they're on a downward trend already. Uh, what is a re appreciable reduction? Uh, it's 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 changing the slope of that that trajectory in a way that's measurable or detectable. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes we have endangered species stabilized. They're maybe not on a downward trend uh, in, in the last year or recent years, uh, and they were listed a long time ago. Uh, uh, and if that's, in, you know, probably there in the next status review, we should consider reclassifying them as threatened. Uh, but that's what it is. I mean, think, think of, a, of, a, of, a, of a line, you know, a, a a projection, a prediction on the, uh, uh, you know, a species population over time, and uh, and you're you're you, we can only predict so far out with reasonable certainty. Uh, but if if best available data says it's pointed towards extinction in that time window, uh, it's endangered. If it's pointed where it's going to get to that point in the near future it'll be threatened and if we're changing the trajectory of that that best available prediction um, that's that's appreciable <coughs> and in the case of critical habitat <coughs> how much conservation you know function value do we need for that habitat unit to provide its intended recovery role uh, you know how much how many nesting trees do we need? How many, uh, you know, undisturbed areas uh, to reach the, the recovery goals? And, and what's the prediction for those features in that area? Are we changing that trajectory? Uh, you know, is, well, it's, 
it's less of a prediction thing there as more as how much do we need compared to how much we've got are we making a measurable detectable difference between those quick question um, yesterday you, you kind of went around talking about the, the different districts and species and how many consultations and which species were involved etc just in general throughout the state <clears throat> not the pinpointed district or species unless it pops up, but where are you having the most involvement with anybody's critical habitat of concern in Florida to the service? Because, you know, we don't run into that as much as... You mean which species have... Or, or yeah, or area. Do you have... Yeah. I'm trying to think the species we look at, critical habitat for the American crocodile, for Avroid snail kite, um, <clears throat> other, I say a lot of the species were less than and they critical habitat wasn't designated. Now, as I understand it now, they're designating critical habitat for every species they list. Yeah, usually at the time of listing. I guess the mussels, you, you deal with a fair amount of the mussels, critical habitat. Yeah. We have a proposed for the red knot on the project. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sturgeon has designated critical habitat. So, so bridge Park. crossings in, you know, in, in Sturgeon yeah, rivers South would... Florida had a few. Yeah, fine. More, more scheduled questions. So, I just, uh, you do a great job, John, so the, on the schedule. So That's a matter of opinion. I know, you, we understand that you have a boss and it has to go through their, their desk first, so I understand that. So, I guess, if, you know, we submit to the core, the core issues are public notice, they request formal consultation. The um, so then from that formal consultation request, then 30 days goes by. So we haven't received anything. Wow. Off the record, do we send you an email and say, Hey, John, did you, well, did you accept our? Well, if it's with the core, the consultation is with the core. You're the applicant, so no, we should respond to them within 30 days. Um, and then typically what happens, yeah, I'll respond to them and typically I'll say, I need this information or if I don't need any information, I might provide concurrence or I might, pro uh, you know. Yeah. That's typically what happens. applicant and with a consultation is with it, you can send me any email as you want that's fine but I mean what you what you're gonna have to do is talk to the core to see where the consultation stands so, but yeah I'm certainly open to emails go ahead send me one. <laughs> so within 30 days you should know whether there's a, well with, with okay remember within 30 days once we get the request uh, if it's a concurrence request or whatever, we need to respond within 30 days. Now, a lot of times that doesn't happen due to our workload, although I may get it out. It goes and gets filed up. But the good news is we may be getting a new supervisor to help us out. So okay. help is on the way, is what I understand. Great. If we get into, we have biological opinion and we get into design and somebody changes the pond or something like that, we have to, to reinitiate. Well, not if the consultation is not complete yet. We're still... But if you have a complete consultation... Oh, and we've issued you a biological opinion? Yeah. And that's new. That's, uh, re yeah. You, yeah you'd, have to re you'd have to reinitiate okay. if you change it, yeah. That's why we like to get those things squared out during or before the consultation. Yeah, sometimes things... We hate when it happens ourselves, too, but sometimes things move. All the, all the same exact timelines... Are the remaining the same? Oh, as far as reinitiation? Well, yeah. yeah, it's a new it's a new it's a new ball game, yeah. Okay. okay, are we ready to move on to the next presentation? On your appreciable reduction, is there kind of a, um, is there a formula you guys follow to kind of look at trends or look at, you know, those components? Is there a percentage of each item or is it when you were describing it earlier, it kind of sounded like statistics where it kind of depends on what you put in and what comes out on the other end. And, um, there could be some 
who decides what the numbers are that goes into the calculation? Is it a set thing? Um, no, we do not have a, a formula. Um, and, you know, it's just not like, you know, is a 10% reduction, you know, constitute appreciable? Uh, and uh, and it's it's always uh, uh, species specific. You know, we deal with everything from, you know, plants and bugs to, you know, panthers. Uh, one size does not fit at all. Uh, so it's very much a fact specific. Uh, termination. Uh, I will say that we don't issue very many Jeopardy opinions. Uh, it is uh, rare. We have issued maybe uh, half a dozen uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, it's something we don't like to do. We like it so that they can fulfill their 7A2 mandate and ensure <laughs> that they do not jeopardize things. Um, uh, so uh, it the, the bar is high for an appreciable reduction. A species with a very small range um, and an action that, you know, straddles a fair amount of that is much more likely uh, to cause jeopardy than one and that a very small project affecting a species that's very widely distributed. Uh, it's harder to get something appreciable. So no, there's no formula, uh, and uh, in in the case of the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, field offices do not sign Jeopardy opinions. Uh, that is not delegated to their level authority. That that has to be signed by the regional director. So, if you've got a project that's going to be a Jeopardy call, or that the field office is recommending as such, it will it will come through to the regional office and I will be working on it and uh, and verifying that in double checking the work of the field office before our regional director signs it. Oh yeah, yeah. If, if you're if you're going to jeopardize something, we'll be talking to you real early and often. If you have a good reason, reinitiation is not the end of the world, and you know, depending on the nature of the change, uh, you know, if if, the, if it's inconsequential to effects to the listed species we've already evaluated, it could be a very quick, you know, yep, we agree that this is really not changing our analysis. Your your bo is still good, you know. Thanks for letting us know. But a lot of times we're going <laughs> we're going to know if it's going to make a difference, and it's better for everybody if we don't. If it's going to make that big difference, we really, they really better have a good reason. And most of the time, we try to tell them. So that's not in anybody's interest to do that. Well, it's kind of the whole point of CBM to avoid doing a five year study and end up with a fatal flaw that shows the project. You, you do know, though, that you know, when you get a BO from us and it's a no, no jeopardy, no adverse mod BO. Uh, that BO is relative to the action as proposed to us for that BO, and if if you go and do something different, you have your you have not complied with Section 7A2 for that different action because you didn't consult on it. Same thing for take statements, which John is going to do now. Okay, and so that'll take. And we want to know what is an incidental take, what is an incidental take statement, and what are the reasonable and prudent measures in terms and conditions included in that take statement. Okay, so Section 9 of the Act and the federal regs pursuant to Section 4D of the Act prohibit the take of endangered and threatened wildlife, respectively. 
And remember, we talked about this definition of the act defines take as to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, or collect, or attempt to engage in such conduct. So that's the definition of take. What's incidental take? Well, the act refers to incidental take in several sections, but it does not provide a definition for the term, and it, but it is defined twi twice in the ESA implementing regulation. Uh, 50 CFR 17.3 says incidental taking means any taking otherwise prohibited if such taking is incidental to and not the purpose of the carrying out of otherwise lawful activity. And 50 CFR 402.02 says incidental take refers to takings that result from but are not the purpose of carrying out, again, another, an otherwise lawful activity conducted, conducted by the federal agency or applicant. I kind of wrote down my own definition just for our purposes. So my definition is of incidental take is take that results from but is not the purpose of a lawful activity conducted by the action agency or the applicant. Why is the incidental distinction important? ESA provides different mechanisms for exempting take, both intentional and incidental, from the take prohibition in Section 9. And Section 7, Section 7B4 and 702 provide a mechanism especially for exempting take associated with actions of federal agencies, what you guys do. And this is in, in the form of a written statement provided by the secretary, and we call this written statement in our biological opinion the incidental take statement. What is an, what does the incidental take, do, take statement do and what is it? It specifies the impact of the anticipated incidental take taking on the species from the action. It specifies reasonable and prudent measures necessary or appropriate to minimize such impact. It provides mandatory, mandatory terms and conditions for implementing those measures so that taking that is in compliance with the incidental take statement or with the terms and conditions in the incidental take statement is not considered prohibited taking. So incidental take statement doesn't authorize take, it basically provides an exemption if you're in compliance with the terms and conditions of the statement. See the difference? So the take covered in the incidental take statement must not be the purpose, or the take covered in the incidental take statement is not the purpose of the action. In other words, you can't have a project that is designed to kill panthers or sand skinks or any other federal species. You can't do that. The take um, from in the ITS results from otherwise action that is lawful, can't be illegal, and it results from an action that does not jeopardize the continuous ex continued existence of listed species or adversely modify critical habitat. So if you do that, we're not going to issue an incidental take statement. The incidental take statement provides the form and the cause of the incidental take resulting from the action. Remember, we looked at these uh, definitions before. Harm um, is defined as an act that actually kills or injures wildlife. And it includes significant habitat modification or deg degradation where it kills or in injures wildlife by significantly impairing their essential behaviors, including Reading, I didn't touch that. <laughs> That's my calendar. It's up, it's up. <laughs> it's time for him to go home. He's off now. <laughs> there we go. Okay, we're back. So, anyway, one form. Um, of incidental take that is common in road projects is harm, and these are such this is such thing as, such things as direct mortality from construction equipment of the of the species, or also habitat loss and modification. 
another common form of of instead will take resulting from road projects harassment and we looked we looked at this before the definition intentional or negligent act creating the likelihood of injury to wildlife by annoying it to such an extent where it significantly affects or disrupt the normal behavior patterns of the species which are not limited but include but not limited to breeding feeding and sheltering so a harassment think of that as something like construction equipment on a site, making a lot of noise, scaring off caracaras, that kind of thing. The amount, okay, the incidental take statement also expresses the amount or the extent of the take due to the action that is anticipated to incur, to occur. And this is expressed as by the number of individuals taken as a density by using a surrogate or by any other reasonable method. Now it's often difficult to express incidental take in the form of number of individuals. Okay, I, think, I, thought, I was thinking about this last night and I couldn't fall asleep because I was thinking about it. <laughs> now, for examples of it, one, one thing I came up with, with was, okay, consider the sand skink. A lot of, a lot of you are familiar with that species because you, because you work with it. Okay, that's a an, a small fossorial lizard that occurs in sandy soils in central Florida and we can document its presence through through track surveys. When we see a track we know it's there. But determining how many skinks are in an area is way more difficult. That would take mark recapture studies that are expensive and take a lot of time. Probably and the other thing <laughs> is, what do you? The, you need to monitor the take from your action, okay? So, so to ensure that you don't exceed take in the statement, which is going to cause reinitiation of consultation, okay? But how do you do that? How do you find a dead sand skink? I've never seen one. I mean, you see them occasionally, but they're really hard to to count. Um, and another example I came up with. Uh, for projects that result in take resulting from habitat modification or degradation and they don't actually directly kill the animal but they affect its fitness, its biological fitness, its ability to survive in its habitat. Okay, So how does habitat modification or habitat loss, how do you, how do you translate that into number of species taken? It's difficult. So what the surveys do is use a surrogate to measure t take because we need something that we can measure and make sure that is not that take is not exceeded. Okay, so a surrogate is defined as a similarly affected species habitat or ecological ecological condition that is used to express the amount or extent of the take of the listed species. In order for the sur service to use a surrogate and a lot of times I use habitat taken okay, because we can quantify that pretty easily and we know when you exceed that. Okay? So, but the, in the incidental take statement or the BO, in order for the service to use, a, or to use a surrogate to measure take, we have to describe the link, the causal link between the surrogate and the take of the species, explain why it's not practical to express the amount of take or monitor take related impacts in terms of individuals for listed species and finally set a clear standard for determining when the amount or extent of the take is exceeded. So example, the project if takes 50 acres of habitat. If you exceed 50 acres of habitat taken, you've exceeded your incidental take that's set in your incidental take statement. And that would cause reinitiation of consultation. Go ahead. Yep, no. Okay, so example, we have a project, we are taking, we've done a structure survey, we're taking X amount of acres, which is have a BO, we're paying mitigation to the nature of the service We're considering that project done, closed, everything settled. However, this is a project that is just perpetually not funded. And the, we are adjacent to conservation land. There's a good chance that maybe there's some burning, maybe there's not. You know, scrub day. Um, habitat may change, make it better, make it worse. 
we're considering them. I mean, my understanding is once we pay the Nature Conservancy, which is still trying to figure okay, out. Okay, so you're saying you, you've gone through the conservation measure for impacts to scrub jays. You had a project that resulted in an incidental take of scrub jays. Yeah. We've so the service issued you an incidental take statement for a specific for amount specific of incidental take. I, I, I appreciate the fact that you're providing the conservation measure. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's really good. But you're not supposed to exceed the amount of take in the bio, in the incidental take statement. So let's say, for example, it was 50 acres of habitat. That was the threshold. And if you cleared 51 acres of habitat, that would exceed this take statement. And that additional or the take is not covered then. We're not clearing any additional. Okay, I'm just saying that's that's yeah. the that's the purpose of the take statement. I'm just saying perhaps maybe 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 a different yeah. example. You know, sand king. Right. Maybe the critters move around. Maybe they come into an area after we shelf something for a little bit, even though we paid mitigation. Maybe they move out, but we don't. Well, but you have your uh, biological opinions already. So you it's an area or area you already have to take a look at. Well, they were there already, weren't they? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm following you because if you have your. You an updated. BO is you get funded for construction and reevaluate what you already got a take statement for. And if the right. quality of the habitat has diminished, then I guess you're going to have credit assessed for. Oh, so what you're talking about is perhaps like a, a modification oh, to the DO? Well, I mean, I mean, I've had situations like with Gwen before where <laughs> they're going, they get their biological opinion for the core perimeter. They will probably the impacting 10 acres of fancy cats that they impacted nine or eight no, or whatever. No, Project details, just as time goes on. Is there a time frame that a case permit is good for? Oh. Five, yeah, five yeah. years, ten years, forever. Yes. We, 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 will, we will usually specify, uh, and we can, and then certainly if you ask us to, we can give you uh, sort of a, you know, a period of performance for a BO. It's like after this, we think that things, would be could be different enough either in the action or the the species use of the action area, et cetera, that you know this is good until then. And after that, if the action hasn't occurred, um, come back to us, you know, for potential reinitiation. Uh, yeah, I don't know that on the last TPO that we could have here we don't. Um, we we typically give uh, kind of you know this bo uh, is effective for such and such for actions that are like management actions things that are going to recur over time but for project you, you know specific you know one time construction thing and I don't know I mean it sounds like it might be a good idea. That way, you have some certainty about uh, the time frame in which we don't need to get back and reinitiate, and 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 we have some certainty that you will get after that. You can have best to use by. Like, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just that you know, for some areas where we have, you know, going back to the scrub jay example, we have conservation <coughs> lands that are being managed. I mean, that's a Kind of a dynamic population. Oh, so you're saying if you have an uh, an area that you got take for right. and into the bank, and then the scrub jays came back, yeah. so we, uh, so there was take, it may could have been a temporary somewhere else. Impact. I mean, it's just it's right. kind of dynamic. But my understanding, and I could be wrong, but kind of once you have your bo and your mitigation is paid, if you don't change the project area, you don't, you know, I'm still clearing 50 acres of scrub, you know, whether or not that 50 acres is Occupied or not, you, you know, it's just it's dynamic to get, I guess, an expiration date. And uh, right now, it's on you with the with the reinitiation criteria. Uh, you know, at the end of the BO, there's a reinitiation notice, and there's four criteria. Uh, you know, you need to uh, uh, 
reinitiate consultation because your compliance with the act is no longer valid if the one of these four things change uh, happen uh, you get new information uh, um, about listed species in the action area. Uh, you, you get new information about the effects of the action on the species. The action changes in a way that may change its effects. Uh, new species are listed in the action area uh, that were not considered in the opinion. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I sort of split those out. And then, and then exceeding incidental take is the fourth. Uh, but that was actually, I told you five, but I, I, I split one of them out into two. So there a two? Yeah, yeah, it could. But see, it's on you to evaluate that and then to request initiation because uh, uh, we're not out there seeing, oh, you need to reinitiate. Uh, we want to survey and show for Five years, even though development had, might have approached yeah. and gotten the species out. I mean, sometimes the money for the survey is, you know, more to do, you know, than to. Oh, so you're saying that this is an area that there weren't skinks before, and you got your, your you cover your whole, you got your incidental take statement, but they moved it, and you haven't completed started your construction yet. Yeah, I'm just. Oh, and you're saying the conditions are set. Yeah. You know, of the species that we deal with, yeah. uh, care yeah. bears can, can move in yeah. to an area. Um, you know, so you, you might have mitigated for what your impacts were at that time, and even though your project area hasn't changed at all in your project plan, and everything still stays the same, but this project just happened to be a perpetual plan update, you know. Um, on the shelf forever, um, not funded for any construction, that sort of thing. Sometimes we do permit things and then put them on the shelf, you know, not necessarily. But uh, we're getting the ozone. So if you got your core permit, wouldn't that you got a, a limit of time that's good for though, right? So so that might you might have to reinitiate anyway or come back to get a new core, core permit if that expires. Yeah. But we're also getting BOs and PD and E. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. So, but that's going to change, I guess, within the next year, maybe, if you guys take over do formal consultation. Oh, or PD&E, right. Okay. I'm thinking yeah. this Federal Highway is asking for, okay. Okay. Let's keep going. Um, so we were talking about why quantifying the amount of take is important. Um, the incidental take statement, remember, is not a blank check for an infinite amount of take. It's a limited amount that is, is provided in the statement. And if you exceed that, it's a reinitiate. Um, another reason why we do that is the no jeopardy conclusion of the BL is based in part by the amount of take that is exempted in the take statement of anticipated take. Um, take reduces the numbers, reproduction, and distribution of a listed species as well. And future consultations must consider that of effect of previously exempted take from other actions on, on the status of the species. That's added to the status of the species when we do our Jeopardy adverse mod determination. Um, when, and as we said before, when, the, when ant, the amount of anticipated take specified in the take statement is exceeded, consultation, reinitiation of consultation is needed. It's necessary. Okay, so how does the service minimize take through an incidental take statement? We're required to specify reasonable and prudent measures that we believe are necessary and appropriate to minimize the amount of incidental take resulting from an action. What are reasonable, prudent measures? They are actions that minimize, that is, reduce as much as reasonably, reasonable and prudent, the anticipated amount or extent of the take resulting from the action as proposed. So measures that reduce take from the action. What are, what are not reasonable and prudent measures? This is important. Actions that avoid, minimize, or compensate for impacts to environmental resources but have no effect on reducing the amount of take resulting from the action. Can you think of 
things that you guys do typically, especially like my districts, to compensate for impacts with environmental resources, buying sand skink credits, buying scrub dray credits, panther credits. We're not supposed to include those as re that action as reasonable and prudent measures doesn't minimize the take. It affects, it helps the species, but it doesn't minimize the take. And our office mistakenly has done that before. Now we're trying to learn. And I guess Jerry can speak to this, but other offices do that as well. They put RPMs in there and say you must do this, but they're really under the act that they're not supposed to. Avoid yeah, we 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 have some some uh, offices that are really uh, gung ho about the mission of the service, and uh, understandably so. Uh, we are passionate about the the resources that we're employed to to manage and protect, uh, and uh, and so um, rather than develop a partnership with the agency. Uh, and get the agency on board with the, uh, the share of that conservation mission. Uh, sometimes we get frustrated and uh, take shortcuts, and we'll just make them do it through an RPM in terms and conditions. Well, that's really not right. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so uh, we have sideboards for RPMs. Uh, they are intended to minimize take, as John was saying, uh, not to compensate for it. Uh, we'd like to see compensation for adverse effects uh, uh, because that'll keep moving the needle, you know, we would just say no to death by a thousand cuts. Uh, but, uh, but strictly speaking, uh, this last bullet there, on the slide, uh, our RPMs cannot alter the basic design, location, scope, or duration or timing of the actions, uh, and involve only minor changes. and And they have to minimize take. So, so if so if you get an RPM that says we want you to compensate for these impacts, you know, in the next county over where it's good habitat for this species, we have violated <laughs> our own regulation. We can't do that. You're right. Uh, but uh, we can encourage you to do so as part of your proposed action. Uh, it's it's sure easier to get to a no jeopardy opinion when you've got, you know, the net effect of the action includes a bunch of benefits. Uh, and uh, But can we make you do that? No. How about no construction during the nesting season? So we can propose that, then it's a term and condition under the RPMs. It said timing of the action. Because that's often what we do or propose. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, if, and if that is unreasonable <laughs> to change that timing, it's something we can't require in an RPM. Uh, but this is, you know, who is the judge of what's reasonable in, in RPMs? It's, it's the action agency. You need to tell us if we're being unreasonable. No, that's really not something we can do. We have to blah, 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 and here's why. Uh, okay. It, it ceases to be, meet the definition of a reasonable and prudent uh, uh, measure. So work with us. We'll work with you. Okay, so what are terms and conditions that implement the reasonable, reasonable and prudent measures? Uh, they are the specific methods or instructions for implementing the RPMs. And again, they're developed with your assistance, the federal agency and the applicant. They include requirements for take monitoring and reporting, salvage and disposition of animals that are taken as well, and are mandatory for the take prohibition exemption to, to apply for the action. Um, in order to monitor the impact of incidental takes, the federal agency or any applicant must report the progress of your action and its impact on the species to the service as specified in the incidental take statement. Okay, what about situations where take the service does not issue an incidental take statement? 
if take is the, of a listed species is not reasonably certain to occur, we don't issue in, incidental take statements because it's not going to occur. For example, this would be a framework programmatic action. What's a framework action? This is a programmatic action that has a developed framework, but that framework does not provide specific enough information on the future actions for the service to determine the amount of take that will occur. Okay, And we do that through future consultations as the actions come online or are proposed. A couple of examples of, those, of a framework programmatic would be like a forest, uh, forest service management plan where they're kind of saying what they're going to do, but it's not specific. Um, another example would be a nationwide permit for the core where they're doing the same type of action. But again, you don't have the specifics to determine the take and that's going to be uh, determined when the actions come online. Other situations where we don't issue an incidental take statement for adverse effects to critical habitat. Unless those effects or activities causing such effects are also reasonably certain to cause the take of the listed species, then we'll issue an uh, incidental take statement. But not, for adverse effects to critical habitat, we don't. We don't issue incidental take statements for proposed actions that are likely to jeopardize listed species or adversely modify critical habitat for the species in the case where there is no reasonable, prudent, and prudent alternative available. If they can't get out of jeopardy, we're not issuing an incidental take statement. Federally listed plants, we don't issue, there's no take on federally listed plants. It is not written in the act. They don't discuss it. Take applies only to listed animal species. All other aspects of compliance with ESA are necessary, 782 are necessary when there's, a when there's a product that affects a listed plant species. In other words, you still have to consult. We have to do our jeopardy analysis and determine if that plant um, will be jeopardized by your actions. So that still applies, but we can't issue take for it because there isn't any. Section 9 of the ESA does prohibit removing or damaging federally listed plants that are classified as endangered on areas under federal jurisdiction in violation of state law or regulation or in the course of any violation of a state criminal trespass law. So there are some minor protections under the Act for federally listed plants, but they're not as strict as those <laughs> provided for federally listed animals. So if I'm attacking a federally listed plant, I have to get to a main effect but not likely to adversely affect to get no, 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 no. When he says we don't do take for plants, it means it's because you don't need an exemption. It's not prohibited. It's not prohibited, right. What if I'm on national forest service land and I'm attacking a forest Then it is. On their property. But on federal. Yeah. yeah. But on pro private property, no. See, we don't, there's not much protection for it. Yeah, on federal lands, it's not on federal lands. It is prohibited to take listed plants, uh, but nowhere else. And okay, and finally, uh, case uh, cases where we don't issue incidental take statements are for um, marine mammals impacts to, to marine mammals, West Indian manatee. There is no take under. Oh, let me. See. Step back for a minute. Marine mammals and the manatee are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act as well as ESA. We talked about that earlier. But the Marine Mammal Protection Act it does not issue take for marine mammals except under very rare circumstances that might involve commercial fishing, fishing impacts or impacts to marine mammals from the military sonar, that type of thing. Then under those limited exceptions, they'll, in, they'll 
uh, issue take from marine mammals, but usually no, there's no take. Okay, so in Florida, the only marine mammal we have is that the services that service regulates is the West Indian manatee, and dolphins and whales are regulated by no fisheries. But it's service policy not to issue a take statement under ESA for the manatee. That's just not done under Marine Mammal Protection Act. Okay. What does that mean? Well, without Marine Mammal Protection Incidental Take Authorization, it means that all actions that affect the manatee must be may affect action or must not must not be likely to adversely affect the manatee. They gotta avoid taking the species, in other words. And we get through that, or we try to do that for DOT projects through the protection measures. But we can't, we don't, so if we found that a, a, a project was going to take the manatee, take manatees, we wouldn't issue a incidental take permit and the project wouldn't go forward. That makes sense? So would, what if you had to do the project? What if you had what? We have to bridge, we have to replace this bridge. I would say, yeah. can you do that bridge replacement without working in water, out, out of the water? Can you do that? First, that's the first thing I would ask. No, because the water's too wide. Okay. Here's, my, here, here's the second thing. Here's the second. work Okay, that's fine. The second thing I would say, can you use, can you employ the in-water protection measures? Yes. That should be enough to, to prevent take from occurring. So you're okay. I mean, that's what we, we had that happen. Yeah, right. And it was really crazy. So we, we could. Where the manatee likes to breathe. Right. So if you do that, we, so if you do that, we can concur with a not likely to adversely affect determination for that action for the manatee, and that fits what I was talking about. It's not resulting in take. Okay. Any other questions? Are we ready to keep going? No. No. Okay. Don't record. Don't you record live? Yeah. You guys act like you're going to go home. Uh, I do. <laughs> uh, we'll, um, for a few minutes if you have some questions. Uh, but I would say have a good evening and we'll see.